It's up to the defense uh, to make the big plays and to shut the best teams down come postseason time if everything goes well. Uh, First, let's talk about some of the guys here in red because they're all dealing with injuries. Reader should be back soon, right? Yes. uh, He could be back week one, although it's probably – I'd expect him to be activated and uh, he might not play week one, but I think week two, week three, he will be in there. Uh, we saw him. Uh, he got to talk to us a little bit. He didn't talk to us. He talked to the coaches who related to us. But uh, he was physically at camp. He looks fine. He had a little bit of a setback from his torn quad. Um, he'll be good. Uh, again, might not be week one. and He might be eased in where he's playing 25% of the snaps the first week and then up, you know, gradually up from that. But he's... Look, having covered him in the past, uh, I covered him when he was in Houston. I, I, I'm so blessed to have this guy. We are very, very lucky as Detroit Lions to have him in here, and just what he's done for the guys around him. And, and we might have talked about this before, but Broderick Martin, who is his backup essentially, um, and, and and will make this team. And, and he talked about how he had never met DJ Reader before, and the first time he meets DJ Reader, Reader had gone through all of his college tape, even going back to when he was at the University of North Alabama before he was even (laughs) at Western Kentucky and picked it over and gave him things that he could point, like what he observed from him. Like, wow, that's, that's what you're getting a DJ reader. That's, that's special. That's rare. And that's great. That, that, that's why I say we're blessed to have him in Detroit. Even if he's not a top five nose tackle anymore, he kind of, he was on the fringe of that last year in Cincinnati and has been for some time. If he's top 15, even we're good. We're good. <laughs> um, Kaminsky. So he suffered uh, a uh, late July knee injury. Yeah. How's he coming along? He will be on IR and it could be very well that he's out for the entire season, but they want to give the potential for him to get back for a playoff push and or the playoffs at the end of the year. Uh, torn MCL with him. Uh, he's already had the surgery, uh, but he will he will be put on IR uh, at the start of the year. Okay. Uh, and then Mosley. Now, speaking of ACLs, oh. so Mosley uh, trying to make his way back. So how how does he? I mean, what's the he what's he's the word? he he's done. Uh, he he's I forget what ex- the exact injury. It wasn't his ACL again. Um, so he tore his ACL in twenty twenty two. Uh, in San Francisco, came in, played two plays in 2023, and tore the other ACL. And this time, I think it was a pec. I think it was a torn pec. What was that? Um, uh, not not terribly long ago. Um, the it was the week. I want to say it was the week leading into the Giants game, uh, which was the first preseason game. Uh, but they he will be on IR. Um, there's, I guess there's some limited chance that he could get back, but this is a guy you're talking about, a guy going, again, going back to college, he's had yeah. massive injury issues. I I say this as somebody who likes and respects him a lot. I really hope he decides that it's time to be done and move on to the next part of his career because yeah. he's going to be, he's going to be a hell of a coach. He's going to be a hell of a position coach someday. Okay. Um, hopefully he gets into that sooner than later because he's an asset. This is a guy, again, came in, didn't have an off season last year. You know, was out. Didn't get activated until end of the year at, because he had complications from his ACL in San Francisco. Was with the team the entire time. Plays the two plays. Doesn't go home after he gets hurt again. Stays with the team and is with them on the sideline, talking to guys in in huddles while he's on injured reserve. After that, like these are people that he doesn't really know. That says a lot about his character, too. Uh, so I, I would love to have him around this team this year. And if he's on IR for the entire season, he, he, he'll still find a way to contribute, uh, as weird as that sounds. All right. Well, then let's talk about uh, the, the spots there yeah. uh, that need to be filled. So what what yeah. about – because who would be considered the, no, the, the backup nickel right now? Uh, so nickel right now is uh, – Amit Robertson has, uh, and I say this having ripped him mercilessly for how bad he played in the slot in Las Vegas, has looked good in the slot, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, right now, it's Ennis Rakestraw getting the second team reps there. Oh, okay. 
And he will also be getting, he'll also get second team reps outside. He's sort of floating between the two. We have seen Kindle Vildor in there at times, uh, but Kindle's better outside. So that's sort of where, and you will still see Brian Branch slide up there occasionally. Sure. Yeah. Um, especially when the, the opposing team, let's say they're in, you know, uh, you know, 12 personnel. And he's at safety and they flex their guy. Like he's gonna he's gonna be the guy that rotates up there. So okay. you'll still see some of that too. Now, what how, how does the secondary look in general? Because uh as we talked a few months ago, uh big transformation. <laughs> yeah, it's lots changed of bodies, a lot. <laughs> and you would hope and it you, it looks for the good. So yes. how is it going? How is yes. how are all the new faces adapting? Carlton Davis will be one outside corner. Terry and Arnold will be the other outside corner. They're both new. Arnold is dealing with a chest injury right now. He'll be fine week one. I have no doubt about that. He uh, made the, had the misfortune of trying to tackle Amon Ross St. Brown in a practice a couple weeks ago and got the worst of it. Um, happened right in front of me. Uh, it was. It looked a lot worse in real time. I was worried that he'd like you know broken a torn a pack or broken a rib or something. It's not that serious. He could play this weekend if he needed to. Um, Carlton Davis has been everything they wanted in an aggressive, in-your-face, press man outside corner. Arnold is the same way. Rakestraw is the same way. Um, he's a lot quieter than those two, but he is a very physical at the line, not going to let you get a clean release type of player, and that's exactly what Aaron Glenn wants. If you remember, Aaron Glenn is a player. He played that way. He's never had cornerbacks who can do anything close to what he did as a player. He's got them now. Yeah, it's gonna be gonna be fun to watch how that develops. And I will say, there's a lot of pressure on Aaron Glenn to to deliver because he's always had the crutch of, like, they're starting they're starting week one cornerback last year. One of them was Jerry Jacobs, um, who couldn't get signed this offseason. He finally last time with the Rams lasted like two weeks in practice. And now he's out on an injury settlement, but. Like he wouldn't be number seven on this depth chart this year. Like that's yeah. how that's how good it is. And and I will give Kendall Vildor and Khalil Dorsey both a ton of credit. They've both played exceptional this summer. They are worthy of making this team, and it could be the only one of them makes it. And uh, that's that's a sign of real progress for this team. Okay. And out of all of those depth guys, uh, who do you think? Or what's uh, take? Because Robertson's new, Davis is yeah. new. We know about Branch and Arnold's and Rakestraw are both uh, the, the the top rookie guys. So everybody yeah. else, who do you think could take? Who do you feel confident will take like another step? That's tough. Um, so at safety, uh, Brandon Joseph has taken a big step up. He has kind of taken over the third role um, from if you ask Malik Fanwu. Um, who lost his starting job because Brian Branch moved back to safety in that spot. Um, Malifan, who's been injured some this summer, which has kind of been a recurring theme for his career, he's much more of a in-the-box or edge-type safety. He did phenomenal at that down the stretch, uh, but that's that's not as big of a role as it has been in the past. Uh, Brandon Joseph more of a coverage guy, so they're going to sort of mix and match on that, or at least that seems to be the plan. You know, cornerback, Stephen Gilmore made this team as an undrafted rookie last year. I don't really see any way he makes it this year. Uh, he's a guy that I hope he latches on somewhere else because he has had his moments this summer, but he's clearly number seven right now, and uh, they're not keeping more than six. They might not even keep more than five. Okay. All right. Uh, let's move up to the uh, front seven. Uh, do you expect Jack Campbell to take a big step? I hope so. Uh, the team does. I'm hopeful that he does too. I'm not as sold on Jack Campbell being great as what the team is and what some of my colleagues are. I think Why? he's going to be. I think he's going to be good. I think he's going to be fine, but I'm not sure that he is the next coming of Randy Gratishar as he's being made out to be. Um, bonus points for anybody who knows who Randy Gratishar is. Oh yeah, um, even though he just made the Hall of Fame, um, was was as a kid growing up in Ohio. Um, in the 70s, Randy Gratishar was the freaking man. Oh, yeah. um, one of my very first football heroes. So I had to had to throw him in there. But, uh, Absolutely. Uh, Campbell has Campbell has his moments. He also has some where he's still flat footed a little bit. He mm -hmm. still sometimes over pursues. Um, will choose the wrong hole from time to time and run defense coverage. He can be like a tick late to pick up on things. 
he's getting better, uh, and the team certainly trusts him. I'm I'm very ha- I'll put it this way. I'm very happy that Alex Anzalone is still there because he's really smart and really good at what he does, and I think that takes some of the pressure off of Jack Campbell. And Derek Barnes playing the Sam role um, has seeded that that other off ball linebacker role to Barn to uh, Campbell, but he's still there. He's still helpful, and he he looks he's playing the role that he played at Purdue. Okay, and it's baffled me for years why the Lions haven't used him in that role. Well, yeah. They finally they finally got him back to doing it, and he looks great. And one of the functions of that is they are playing more with three linebackers on the field than they ever have under Dan Campbell. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if I had to put a number on it in practices, I'd say it's probably over 35 to 40%, somewhere in that range. And just the 2022 season, they had 11 snaps the entire season with three linebackers on the field. Yeah. So uh, they, they have been straight base nickel the entire time. And that is changing a little bit. And some of that is because Barnes is really effective at rushing the passer and they're looking for that, but also Campbell and Anzalone and coverage have, have done enough. And Brian branch moving back to safety solidifies the back end coverage enough that they feel like they can do that and get bigger okay. and, and, and be more of an attacking defense, um, which they can't do as much when you're in nickel. Okay. So it is more of, now we have the personnel. This is what we wanted to do. Or mm-hmm. is it, mm-hmm. well, we have the personnel. We might as well do it. What, what do you think it is? Uh, so that that's a very good question. I'm, I like the way you phrase that. I think it's more of the latter. I think it's like we have this personnel. Let's let's use it the way we want to. Okay. Um, but, you know, Derek Barnes, he, he improved a lot as an off-ball linebacker. But there were still times where you're like, Jack Campbell should probably have that role. And that's what they did. So it's good. All right. So you maybe what you're saying is, is uh, you, you, you haven't seen it yet. Maybe you will see it with Campbell. You just don't think that you've seen it. Yeah. Yet. And, and, uh, yeah. And th- it's not consistent. Um, there are times where he's been great. Uh, he played really, really well in the joint practices against the Giants. Uh, he's looked very good at times in camp. Uh, he had a dominant day. When was it? Not this week. It was the last practice before Kansas City game. Um, he was all over the field and making plays everywhere. Uh, so it, it's there. It's, it's just one of the things. He's, he's in his second year. He is in a different system than he played in in college, and he's, he's adapting to yeah. it. Um, I, I, he, he will certainly be good. I have no doubt that he will be good. But if there's some people that are writing some pretty, pretty lucrative checks about his impending greatness and i'm not there yet with him. okay uh, but but he'll be good he'll, okay. no no doubt about that <laughs> and up front uh yeah. aiden now do you think that he is going to take a really big step this year do you think that he has that type of top three four edge rushers nfl greatness in him 100 percent. and i i said this uh on a radio program i was on earlier today if you are looking for a value investment, betting on Aiden Hutchins to be the NFL Defensive Player of the Year is a worthy one. That I that's a lottery ticket I would absolutely buy. In fact, I might have bought one of those. He has so I covered Miles Garrett, I covered JJ Watt towards the end of his Houston prime. Aiden Hutchinson is every bit as good as either of those two that I ever saw from them this summer. He has taken that proverbial next step. He is nasty. He, he has been consistently beating Panay Sewell. And Panay is the best right tackle in football. And that's, that's not about Panay. That's about Aiden Hutchinson. That's that's the best way I can say it. <laughs> oh, he's 11-1 to one to win the NFL Defensive Player of the Year. So he is behind Watt, Parsons, Garrett, Crosby and Nick Bosa. He belongs. He certainly belongs in that conversation with yeah. all those guys. And by the way, there um, are six guys the top that are considered the top six, and he's yeah. in them. And then there's a drop off from eleven to one to thirty to one when you go to the next group. So he's yeah. he's hanging with that first group, a little on the outside, but he he's there. He's like the best bargain out of that six, being eleven to yeah. one. So that's that's, that's why a good you one. buy it. Yeah, I like um, it. I, uh, I, I, okay. 
I still favor Miles Garrett. I, I freaking love Miles Garrett. I'm not going to. Yeah. But he's, he's, yeah, we he's, were he's talking incredible. about because they were uh, we, we were given uh, on that we were doing that show and we were doing predictions on everything and as far as the MB, as far as all those uh, awards and uh, they were a couple of guys said yeah Miles Garrett we're going to say he's going to win again defensive MVP and then we were looking at the odds for NFL MVP and could I, I could not believe that Miles Garrett is 200 to 1 to win the NFL MVP it, it, but it's not because of who he is it's just it's those are the odds yes because it's yeah. like they're basically Vegas is just spitting in the face of the NFL and who and who gives these awards on saying you're not going to give him the award no matter how good he is so we'll put him at 200 to 1 that's how that's, that's how pretty much an offensive it. award I, i'll say this aiden hutchinson probably deserves more love than he's getting in those odds as well for nfl mvp uh, that's a quarterback award we know yeah. about that i know um, it's unfortunate i will say if the lions have the same offense that they did last year and they're their top five for, for the third year in a row in in yardage and scoring and amon ross st brown sets the league record for receiving receptions and yardage. He probably won't get yardage, but I, I really do think he's going to set the NFL record for receptions in a season this year. He probably deserves more love than he's getting in those odds too for NFL MVP. Let's see. Where do I see uh, St. Brown here? You probably have to scroll down a little bit. Let me see who's the first <laughs> non-quarterback. That would be – well, that's definitely McCaffrey. And McCaffrey's 40 to 1. And he's okay. the first non quarterback. He's, really he's really good. <laughs> yeah. And then he got Tyreek as the first receiver. But yeah, I'm having to go way down yeah. here. Uh past Miles Garrett, it looks like at 200. And I'm on is at 250. Yeah. That's a good one. I like that one. Because at least he's on offense. That's so right. If he has like a Jerry Rice type of year, then why not? You know? I mean, if, if he if he's get, it's very realistic for him to get twelve targets per game, consistently, um, and there will be some weeks where he might get a few more than that. I don't see him. I don't see any game where he plays the entire game where he doesn't get ten targets, and he's going to catch seventy percent of those. Seventeen oh games. That's a lot of catches. <laughs> that's a lot of opportunity to show off, and he is incredible after the catch. And I might, Ben Johnson I might, I, is a wizard at designing plays for him to get yards after the catch. I like that. I think I have the third or fourth pick in my year-to-year -year league this year, so I know I'm not. I wouldn't be able to get him on the um, with my second pick. So I'd have to yeah. really be ballsy enough to think about taking him. But you know what? In our league, because we have our rules are really about like uh, we have rules that really favor like if you're you're a big play player, you, you, no matter where. You know your your wide receivers are starting to get drafted early. So any any other fantasy fans that are watching this, because I would definitely consider rolling the dice and being aggressive and taking your advice and saying, "Hey, why not? I'll take St. Brown to whatever I have, three or four. Why not?" So the, the 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 caveat with fantasy is he might not get a lot of touchdowns. Interesting. And his yards per catch, or he's not going to touch. That where, mind, where, yeah. yeah, he's not going to touch where Tyreek is. Um, but he he's not going to be Justin Jefferson Jamar. That's that's not who he is. But he's going to get you a solid 12, 12 and a half. Um, might lead the might lead the league in total yak. I don't know if it'll be per catch, but like total yards after the catch. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an easy one for me. <laughs> yeah, if, uh, if, I know the league I'm in doesn't have that, but there are leagues yeah. that do have the whole targets yeah. and. Uh, reception D of points. So that, that would definitely favor him more than yeah. other leagues. Okay. Definitely. So um, Davenport. Now this could be another big, uh, Trust, man. <laughs> this, this is, this is a player that really does need to produce. So far. So good. Okay. So far. So good. He's been healthy. He looks good. He's a great scheme fit with his length and his ability to go speed to power or power to speed. He can do both. We've seen it. He has been very good in camp. Just for the love of God, stay healthy. Play more than 12 games. Play more than two games. That's That, that would be great because the, the one of the biggest questions on this defense, and we all have it, 
from fans to media to the coaching staff itself. Who's opposite Hutch? Who's going to be that second pass rusher guy? That's one of the reasons why they're playing Barnes more at Sam because he's very good at that. And that brings a different angle dynamic. You can line him and Hutchinson up next to each other. Good luck blocking that, but teams will try. So if they do that, who's the guy from the backside? I really hope it's Marcus Davenport, and I say that knowing that Minnesota fans and New Orleans fans are laughing their butts off at me for hoping that. Oh. But so far, so good. He's got to, like you said, he's got to stay healthy. And yeah. if he stays healthy, then uh, he's still at the prime of his career. So he looks good. He's a good fit. <laughs> Who is the next guy? Because uh, this is another area. I would yeah. think of concern depth wise that if anything were to happen to Aiden, um, oh, I'm yeah. not saying for the season, that's, I'm just saying. Yeah, that's that's tough. <laughs> um, yeah. Josh Pascal has stepped up some, but this is a guy who's missed a lot of time going back into college pretty much every year of his career. He has, and we actually got to talk to him the last practice. Uh, he has embraced being a power guy. Um, he's back up over 270. Last year he played in the 260 range and sort of never really had a fit. Um, you know, as a stand-up rusher, he, he's embraced being a power guy and it, it's, he's wearing it well. So I think he's going to play more and more consistently. But at edge, then you're then you're looking at James Houston, um, who's injured right now and missed most of last season with an injury and hasn't done a lot this summer. Um, you go back to his rookie season, he ended the year with, with eight sacks in seven games. It was phenomenal. Yeah. There's There are a lot of – he's a very polarizing player. There are a lot of fans who are still like, oh, you're going to roll him back out there and he's going to get 20 sacks this year. And there, <laughs> there's, then there's the reality of the fact that he's repping with the third team defense consistently this summer and hasn't done a lot there. Um, he flashes from time to time. But uh, there was a play the other day um, in their, in their uh, practices. He lined up in at the right defensive end spot, and immediately Nate Sudfeld audibled to a um, like a delayed handoff. And he because he knew that Houston would run up the field and Craig Reynolds would have a hole. And sure enough, Reynolds took off and, and ran 60 yards down the field, not getting touched. Um, that's, that's the issue with James Houston right now. And also the fact that he's not healthy. Uh, I will say that Mitchell Agude is pushing him. I don't know if he's going to push hard enough to get him off the roster. Um, Isaac Uklu has been a very pleasant surprise. I remember watching this guy at Ole Miss. And I'm like, man, that guy's athletic as heck. But, you know, the, the football elevator isn't going to the top floor, so it's, it's starting to go up. <laughs> he's, he's made some plays. Uh, and uh, it's one of those things where you're wondering, now, okay, maybe Ole Miss wasn't a good fit for him. Maybe, maybe he needed to. Be somewhere else because he's looked good. Um, at minimum, both of those guys are like massive priority practice squad guys. And uh, if anybody gets hurt, they're they're going to rush right into that. And you know, with the injury history with Houston and with Pascal and with Davenport, you got to have some guys there uh, at the ready because uh, d depending on all three of those guys to play all seventeen games is nope, not going to do it. Yeah, that's why there, there's got to be concerning that as much as the team wants and in a way could really need, in a way maybe needs uh, Davenport to step up and deliver. Yeah, they do, 100%. It's, it's asking almost like this is like a player that really hasn't delivered, so it's like, wow, what happens if he doesn't deliver? Yeah. And then there's uh, a big problem. I don't want to think about that, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. It, 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 it's um, And that's where, you know, if Houston can recapture some of his former glory, if if Agude can can do what he's done this summer, if Uku can do what he's done this summer, there, I don't feel I'm not frightened by it. It's it's it would be a bummer, but it wouldn't be one of those catastrophic things. Now, if Hutchinson goes down for any length of time, that's a problem. But oh yeah, again, existential dread about losing your stars to injury <laughs> is something that plagues every team. Oh yeah. Especially the ones that aren't used to uh, the fan bases uh, that aren't used to the success. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it's like tough. the one thing that always creeps back in your mind is uh, something's gonna happen. I, I remember cover. I remember covering the Texans team when JJ Watt first got hurt. And, oh. uh, the 
the, the proverbial wind out of the sails just went the opposite direction. That was so tough. Did. But yeah. they got through it. Um, they, they did. They were, they were competitive again. Yeah. Uh, they did. It did. Yeah. All right. So give me a uh, – you already mentioned a few of these guys. Uh, so uh, – yeah. Have you mentioned the, uh, the the college free agent guys? You've mentioned all of them that need to be talked about then? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Makai Wingo deserves some love. He and Ali, um, uh, Ali McNeil. Um, if you're looking for a breakout candidate, oh. Ali McNeil. Ali McNeil is a monster this summer. He has been unblockable. And he's going against Frank Ragnow, who is arguably the best center in the league. And until yesterday was the highest paid center in the league and worthy of that. Um, Creed Humphrey, great player too. Like, okay, that's good. Good for him. He, he earned it. Aleem's been ridiculous. Uh, and he has he has a maturity to him. This, this is his fourth year. And you saw him kind of break out last year. There's a different sort of determination and attitude with him this year um, where he's not as wide-eyed as he has been. And uh, he's wearing that very well. New defensive line coach Terrell Williams is, you cannot say enough about how significant of an addition he has been uh, for for Williams, for Broderick Martin coming along, um, for McNeil, um, bringing Kyle Pecco with him. Kyle Pecco is going to start at no tackle until DJ Reader is ready to go. And Pecco has played very well. He has been better than any other version of Kyle Pecco I've ever seen. And uh, that's nice to see because – Again, everybody who played no sack last year is gone. Isaiah Bugs, Benito Jones, Tyson Aluelu. If they took a flyer on that, like that's the past. We're we're, we're much better now. Um, yeah, and that's important too because if there is an issue on the edge, depth wise, having that much talent inside that yeah. makes up for it. So. Oh, absolutely. Um, just one one quick thing on the the undrafted guys, uh, Lauren Strickland. Uh, uh, safety out of Ball State. Um, he is a big time hitter. He will land on the practice squad. Uh, they like him a lot. Uh, they got to teach him some discipline and coverage, but uh, you do not want to be in the way of Lawrence Strickland when he's coming at you. 